Check one. Check two. I hear the train a-coming. It's rolling round the bend. I ain't seen the sunshine since. I don't know when. Hello. Welcome to Casual Comic Book Herald Live. <laughs> I don't really call it Casual Kirko anymore, do I? Comic Book Herald Live. I mean, mostly we still just talk about Krakoa. Like, I don't know. It was like a branding thing. It was kind of like, oh, we might talk about other comics, not just X-Men. Let's be honest. <laughs> Let's be honest. Hello, everybody. I'm Dave Busing, founder and editor-in-chief of comicbookherald.com. You're listening to Comic Book Herald Live for the week of March 15, 2023. We're going to talk today about the X-Men comics that came out, as well as anything else interesting going on in the world of comics and pop culture. We, of course, tomorrow have the X-Men 60th Anniversary Celebration Special, which would normally not necessarily be like that big a thing. It's a Marvel Unlimited exclusive. It's a Zoom meeting. Did you register? You had to register to go and attend. It's basically a Comic-Con panel, but they got like everybody. <laughs> Marvel's got Marvel's bringing out all the stops for this X-Men celebration. It's going to be the classics. It's going to be Chris Claremont, Louis Simonson, Rob Liefeld. Who, why Why Marvel is courting Liefeld as hard as they are is one of the <laughs> most bizarre. Like, dude has done nothing over the last... Like, dude speaks his mind, okay? And credit where it's due there. But dude is also rude as hell. <laughs> Super cruel to, like, a bunch of current Marvel creators. And yet, they just absolutely cannot quit. Cannot quit the Rob. Uh, but they're also going to have Jonathan Hickman. And then recently announced as well, they're going to have flipping Grant Morrison. Grant Morrison's going to be there talking X-Men. I mean, every first off, we're reading, rereading Morrison's new X-Men in the My Marvel This Year Reading Club, where we go through the history of Marvel Comics from its origins to today. And listen, new X-Men holds up. I mean, there is a reason that 2001 to 2004 run is celebrated to the degree that it is. Um, there's like a little mid-period where it's kind of not, you're like, okay, you know, it, maybe some of the stuff works, some doesn't. But then once you hit like issue like 133, through to the end, like, was it, 150, 151? I mean, it's just impossible to knock any of those. Like, it's so good. It's so good. Really holds up. But my understanding of, like, Morrison's time on New X-Men is, like, by the end, they were more than ready to be done with that franchise. Like, I have not heard them reflect on that period positively. Um, although I suppose it's they, they seem to be in a very reflective state as a creator. If you follow their newsletter... On Substack, Grant Morrison has a lot to say, like annotating their own works at this point as well. Um, but that that's a get. I mean, that's a get. Claremont, Hickman, Morrison? Yeah, I'm attending. I'm attending that conversation. The biggest problem I have with the X-Men 60th anniversary special is not that they invited Rob Liefeld, which is like maybe like second. Number one is they scheduled it during March Madness. Thursday at, what is it, 6 p.m. Central Standard Time, I've got to choose between an X-Men live 60th anniversary celebration special or the first night of March Madness. Twist, I'm not choosing. I'm going to watch both. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm 100% going to have basketball on, on a tablet or whatever, and then the, the X-Men thing, and maybe I'll live tweet it or something. Follow me at Comic Book Herald. Um, but I got I got to watch this thing. I got to see what it's going to be. I don't know. Maybe it'll be boring. Maybe it'll be lame. But, like, it's, it's an interesting cast. They were taking questions from listeners ahead of time. So they're definitely going to curate and sort of pick and choose. I mean, if this was like, you know, a podcast and you had a good moderator, <clears throat> I don't know, somebody, somebody we know, maybe, I don't know, somebody, um, you could actually point this in like some really interesting conversations around like Claremont has been critical of Krakoa, Liefeld has been critical of Krakoa, Jonathan Hickman created <laughs> or co-created Krakoa. Have a conversation about that, right? You could have a really interesting conversation about these different viewpoints of this thing. We'll see if it actually gets there. We'll see if it actually gets there. Um, if it's anything like being at a Comic-Con, fans will ask super weird and generally useless questions. <laughs> if you've ever been to a con, fans ask the strangest, uh, often worst questions. Uh, but hopefully it's not that. Hopefully it's not that since they have time to curate ahead of time. Nonetheless, I will be attending. If you have a Marvel Unlimited subscription and uh, and you haven't signed up for this thing, you Probably, I don't know if, it, if it's going to fill up or what, um, but that's the way to do it. I don't know. Check it out. It's, it's the X-Men 60th anniversary special. Marvel's got sign-up links on their site, but you have to sign up for the Zoom ahead of time to get in on it. But yeah, I will definitely be, be there for that. It should be super interesting. I mean, the big question that it raised 
when they announced uh, uh, that Graham Morrison was going to be there is, is Graham Morrison going to come back on X-Men? Or, frankly, any Marvel property for that matter. Now, Morrison is in a phase of their career where they said they're done with superhero comics. I think Superman and the Authority was supposed to be sort of the final statement on just this incredible DC Universe tapestry that Morrison leaves behind. So it seems incredibly unlikely that Morrison would want to undo that for, I don't know what, like a Krakoan mini? Uh, That said, (laughs) they're already announced they're coming back doing a a solo story for the DC Pride uh, anniversary special later this year. So I don't know. I mean, obviously, Morrison could do whatever the hell they want. At this point, you know, just an absolute living legend. I find it incredibly hard to believe they would want to come back for an X-Men story. Um, And it's also, like, really hard to to see that fitting, right? To see them coming back and being like, you know, just doing like a side thing. I don't know, just too too big a persona, too big a creator to be doing that while you're trying to have Gillen and Ewing at the head of the thing. I mean, of course I'd read it. Of course I'd be fascinated by it. But I don't see it happening. So I don't know. I don't know what the, the general temperature is on Morrison's potential return to X-Men, but I, I'm guessing it's really just more the reflective, you know, what it was like to be on New X-Men side of things just for this event, would be my read on the situation. Uh, okay, but again, today we're going to talk about the comics that came out today, uh, primarily focusing probably on Immortal X-Men number two, part of the Sins of Sinister event. There will be spoilers for today's comics. Uh, so Immortal X-Men, Wolverine number 31. Get in your questions, your thoughts, all that fun stuff here in the chat. I will address what I can. But otherwise, again, spoiler warning for what is to come. If you haven't read them, I recommend that you go and do so. All right, let's see. We got some questions coming in in the chat. I will get to those as we can. Otherwise, let's dive right in. Okay. Immoral X-Men number two. This is our 100 years in the future vision of Sinister Schemes, as told to us by Kieran Gillen. Mr. Sinister has lost control of his Sinister Council, and we really get a heavy POV from the perspective of Hope Sinister. I think all of the Council members in their Sins of Sinister guises can kind of, basically they all become members of the Ramones at this point, you know? So we have Hope Sinister, Charlie Ballgame Sinister, Emma Sinister, right? You just add Sinister to the end of their name. And we know we're talking about essentially an alternate universe version, even though, yes, this is, in fact, the universe. Wink, wink, nod, nod. So we get Hope and Exodus using chimeras to blow up planets a hundred years in the future. Stuff that we see kind of teased very quickly in the pages of the preceding Nightcrawlers number two. The biggest things that happen here in Immortal X-Men number two, which is a little stally. It's a little stally. You know, I, I I talked about celebrating the speed of Sins of Sinister, and I still think that we should. Um, but we are halfway through right now, you know, if not a little bit more so. And I guess the, the biggest challenge I have with Sins of Sinister kind of as we are in year 100 here is we really feel like we're in a race for Dominion amongst the major players, you know? So, like, Mother Right just shows up at one point with just, like, unconscionably British slang and clues Mr. Sinister into the stakes, essentially. Lays out all the different Sinisters, says who's on the board, says who's fighting for Dominion. And the race for Dominion, which is a, you know, an ascendancy to a cosmic entity that is beyond space and time, and that, you know, in effect, can escape the threat of the rise of the machines. If you boil it down very simply, that's kind of how it's being used right now. We're deep enough into this now that for me at least, the race to Dominion kind of can't come fast enough. Like I'm ready, I'm already there. <laughs> you know, like I'm, I feel like I'm good. I'm not that curious anymore to sort of see these players put, like go through their paces, you know? Um, I'm, I guess, you know, I'm year 1000 has the potential to be interesting. I just think the first two year 100 issues all just feel like it's kind of the inevitability of what was built. And 
I don't know that that anything about this is a, is especially revelatory, or or even that different or interesting. Frankly, I feel a little trapped. Feel a little trapped, just like Sinister, right? Where he wants to get out of this timeline. He wants to find his Moira's. Maybe that's how we're gonna do it. Um, nonetheless, like it's a it's a solid read. I enjoy Immoral X Men a little bit more than Nightcrawlers. Um, I think Gillen writes Mother Righteous. Like Mother Righteous feels like a Wicked and Divine character. And Gillen, just in his hands, I do tend to prefer her in the limited interaction that we've had with her, despite the fact that Spurrier is the, you know, really the owner of that character. Um, the interesting stuff that happens here. Okay, Mr. Sinister creates his first Rasputin four. Rasputin, character we were introduced to in Powers of Ten, right? A Chimera. A Listen, we're playing the hits on this one. This one is big time nostalgia, bring it back to Powers of Ten. Even knowing that, I'm super here for it. You know, Sinister is still trapped and on the verge of his own council ending him, so he frees this Rasputin of her genetic locks, or whatever he calls them, and turns her loose to help him find his Moiras. He positions it, clearly lying, as a um, heroic quest, essentially. That, you know, basically he's like, Krakoa was a paradise, and I realize that now. He does not. <laughs> <laughs> that is that is not authentic. Nonetheless, he needs his Moira's back so he can take everything that he's learned. For example, all the information about the different Sinisters and the original Nathaniel Essex and the plan to escape the machines, and that he can use the Moira save points and go back and do it again and avoid the sins of Sinister timeline. That is the that is the beauty of the concept and the alternate reality here is Mr. Sinister gets the reality where everything is sinister. And he needs to escape it and get out to get back to one that he likes better, right? And that's that's how it was pitched, right? He gets everything he ever wanted, and he need, and he desperately wants out, <laughs> you know? Um, which is really smart and a really good use of this character. Uh, but nonetheless, like, that's where we're at, is he's created this Rasputin. It is his first successful chimera that merges five genetic sequences of mutants. He tells Hope and the Council that six is impossible, Um and we are kind of just left to accept that. It's it's a little unclear with this character. Like, okay, is that actually true, right? Because that could be a thing that gets pulled out at a later date. You know, what, what about the sixth gen chimera, right? That could be a thing that comes up later. But for now, we're essentially told that Rasputin is basically the pinnacle of, of chimeras and is especially unique, which is good, right? This character has a legacy and is interesting. Um, I mean, I do think, you know, one thing we talked about or have talked about extensively, of course, is because of Powers of Ten... You know, Rasputin gets sucked into a black hole with Zorn in the Powers of Ten event that kicks all this off. And, you know, I've been waiting forever to see, like, okay, can that character return, that life, that Moira's ninth life, Rasputin specifically, return into this timeline? This is merely the creation of another Rasputin as opposed to that direct, you know, travel through a black hole connection, which I still feel like is out there, but obviously, which each passing year... <laughs> <laughs> becomes less and less likely. Um, so yeah, okay. It's it's in his, there's the tease at the end of this, um, which is essentially it should only take us five years. We know the third issue of Immoral X Men is going to be jumping a thousand years into the future. Uh, so that's exciting. That's interesting. I'm I'm very interested in the massive time jump to year one thousand because that's where the most details are going to have to be filled in, and creators are going to have to work really really flipping fast to get us to the Dominion conclusion. Um, so at this point, like, I'm like, all right, yeah, let's get to year 1000. Like, I am I am itching to get there. I think we're a little bit stuck. Uh, I'm seeing two comments here that Justin and Alfonso are saying they think Sinister was being sincere. It does read that way. I mean, it does read that way, right? Gillen does not give us the wink. He does not give us the obvious fingers crossed behind the back with Sinister. Everything he says feels like a thing that uh, a person with with empathy or who has developed some heart might say. I don't buy it for Mr. Sinister. I do not buy it for a second. I think he's just bummed <laughs> that his plan backfired so spectacularly, right? Again, it's everything he ever wanted. And it's gone horribly, and he's no longer in control, and is effectively now just being manipulated and utilized at the whims of the other Sinisters, who once they learn 
that that no chimera is possible beyond Rasputin are just like, okay, yeah, so it's time to kill him, right? That's where Mr. Sinister is at. He needs out desperately. He's been trying for 100 years and is trapped. This is his chance out. He is lying to Rasputin because he has built in this sort of heroism quest. Um, I do not believe for a second. It is sincere. That is not this character. You all have been bamboozled. <laughs> you have been tricked. I mean, again, to bring it back to Wick Div, you know, a very similar character in in Gillen and McKelvey's Wicked and Divine is Woden. And that character as well has these moments where it's like when they are on their heels and they need something and they need help, they can say things that sound like things a real human being would say, you know? Or, but that is not their personality, and everything we have learned about them prior to this point tells us, uh-uh, it's not for real. You know, we, this is not, I don't know what Sinister status is going to be post-Dominion. I mean, that still is, I think, a really interesting question. Um, but it's definitely not going to be, I've seen the error of my ways, Sinister. If we get back... The first thing Sinister is doing is trying again, <laughs> but with the information he has this time and trying to figure out, okay, but how do we, how do I avoid X, Y, and Z so that I don't lose control? You know, it's really just that he's not in control of the situation, not necessarily the situation he's created. Um, yeah, as Trinidad M points out here, Mr. Sincere, he is not. Okay. He's not Mr. Sincere. Don't get, get the name confused. Um, he does know he screwed up. He knows he screwed up in terms of losing power. Absolutely. Absolutely. I do not buy for a second that he thinks Krakoa is some beautiful paradise. Okay. Uh, regardless, though, regardless, that's where we're going. One thing I was unclear on, Hope's commander log talks of capturing Mystique and, you know, presumably using her for gene parts because Sinister has a Mystique, um, oh, what is it? Uh, P -P -P Grey Crow, I think, Chimera. Um, but does this mean that Mystique has been killed off screen? Because that would upend Destiny's plans. So that's the really interesting question going into Storm and the Brotherhood number two is, because Destiny's whole deal right now is actually I want the Sins of Sinister to continue because in this future, I have a future with Mystique. But if that has been ended then Destiny's going to want out just as much as, as anyone else, right? Um, so there's, you know, it's interesting to see Mother Righteous laying out, basically, here are the players, and it's the three Sinisters all vying for Dominion, but of course what she leaves out and doesn't realize is that Destiny and Mystique are a major player. So I thought that felt kind of wrong. Either that is semi-spoiling or, or letting out a little bit early what's to come in Storm of the Brotherhood, or it's a misdirect. And, you know, we're talking Mystique, we're talking shapeshifting, misdirect is the name of the game. Um, but that was a really interesting detail that could have major ramifications. It would, I mean, if Mystique is actually killed in that way, it totally changes what Destiny's role is going to be in year 100. But it also, like, like doing that off panel and fast-tracking that, as opposed to that being a big part of Ewing's story, feels off to me. So I'm not sure I buy that. Definitely not sure I buy that. Um, okay. I think that's it, though. For Moral X-Men number two. Like, I don't have a ton to dig in on on this issue. I mean, again, like I said, I think last week, the Sins of Sinister hardcover is going to be a pretty good time. It's going to read definitely way better altogether, as most comics do, frankly. Certainly most superhero comics. Um, but yeah, I am, I am definitely feeling an itchiness to get, get moving with your 100 in a way that I did not necessarily in the first five years. Uh, I don't know. What's everyone else think? What do you all think of Sins of Sinister right now? I'm going to take a big swig from our sponsor today. Today's episode of Comic Book Hero Live is sponsored to you by local Chicago tap water. I've got it here in a falling apart Hulk Nalgene. I think I recommend or requested recently if any listeners have excellent Nalgene rec or just big water bottles. We don't need to be, they're not a sponsor. I don't need to say their name. Um, let me know. If you have some cool water bottle suggestions, I will take one. But I got my big 48-ouncer right here. We're going to swig some water while you all get into some questions. <sighs> all 
James says, Mr. Sinister's appeal to Rasputin reminded me of the portrayed empathy he exhibited to Nate Gray in X-Man number three and number four. I didn't buy it then either. This, of course, being a callback. Are you talking the solo series or are we talking Age of Apocalypse? Could go either way. Either way, Sinister is not to be trusted. I think present Sinister will find all this very interesting. Do you remember when his last save was made? Xavier asked. Interesting question. Interesting question. Um, let's see. James also points out Sinister would already have had Mystique's DNA to clone with. That seems fair. Probably. Right? Yes, for sure. He would have. Uh, JD says, I think Destiny of X is good. I do. But I'm starting to think Fall of X will be ending Hickman's story elements. Duggan is tying up storylines and Sins of Sinister is hitting all the Hox Pox beats. Am I crazy? I don't think you're crazy, JD. I don't think you're crazy. I think it is very possible, and frankly, I hope it's the case, that Fall of X does actually present an end to Phase 1 of the Krakow era. You know? Like, if it is, if there is an actual three-act structure to this, and we are still stuck in the Krakoa portion of that structure, the Krakoa on Earth portion, right, which I would consider phase one, um, I hope, <laughs> frankly, that Fall of X is the end of that. That does not mean it's the end of this, you know, era of X-Men comics, right? It just means that then we can open the doors to phase two, which is, of course, mutants in space, uh, maybe mutants in the multiverse, right? Mutants truly expanding and going elsewhere because the humans of Earth were not ready for them, and they chased them away. I mean, Orcus is well positioned to do that. So, I mean, I don't think it's actually going to end specific, you know, you say it ending Hickman's story elements. That I don't think it will achieve, um, because if the, if the interesting Hickman story elements that have still not been really resolved are still to be explored in the non-Sins of Sinister alternate reality universe, including, you know, the biggest one, which is like time traveling Omega Sentinel, you know, does that get a, does that get space in Fall of X? That would be interesting. But, uh, you know, I, I think there's enough of those that like those are going to be incorporated into a phase two and then ultimately probably a phase three. Um, as opposed to, you know, kind of, I think what you're suggesting is Fall of X, like, almost truly resolving the Hox Pox era and then setting the stage for something entirely new. I guess I, I think there will still be some continuity and some lingering Hickman foundation that things are building on, I guess, if that makes sense. But but I don't think you're crazy. Like, I, I do think it's the right time to pull that, or at least now it is, right? Like, it's a sunk cost whether or not we should have done that earlier and kept Hickman around, right? But here we are. Should Fall of X, like, actually be a pretty dramatic change? Yes, it should. It is It is definitely time. Uh, what else do we got here? Da -da. Okay, okay. Uh, the other issues that came out today, we had Wolverine number 31. There's a quote in here. I, okay, I'll just start here. When I saw that this was part one of a story, <laughs> I almost I almost threw my coffee straight up in the air, caught it, and took a sip. That's how upset I was. <laughs> I was not happy about that. I thought we were, res like, resolving the Beast thing. The reality is we're entering part one of another Beast thing. It's a pretty good Beast thing, <laughs> I gotta say. Uh, that said, there's a quote in this issue. This doesn't really feel like an ugly end. It feels like a bad beginning, says Wolverine. That also describes the Ben Percy run really well. Okay? Just like, like it's just a constant beginning. And increasingly, it feels bad. <laughs> it started out fine. But it's just like, my man, stories should have some resolve. Some conclusion. Um, I have ragged on the Percyverse. Uh, definitely for the last handful of weeks. I do think Wolverine is like, that's the that's the book right now that I'm definitely, I'm, I'm like interested in picking up each new issue. You know, we get the introduction here, spoiler alert, the flipping council of rogue beasts. We have Beast activating protocols that include him 
uh, uh, creating like a sentient kaiju out of Krakoa and walking into the ocean. <laughs> like there is cool stuff happening, unquestionably. And it, frankly, it's good to have Beast just out in the open doing a Mr. Sinister meets Thanos. You know, like, like yes, just full on super villain it. Underwater base, working with your own clones, espousing the values of amorality. And, and complete and other pragmatism. You know, it kind of feels though, and this has been been something that definitely we we have talked about in the Percyverse, like this feels like an event, okay? Beast, the head of mutant CIA, walking into the ocean and declaring <laughs> rogue status. You know, this is something that should have tendrils outside of the Percyverse. But at this point, it won't really, at least until Fall of X. It's just like everything that happens in these books stays in these books and doesn't expand out in the ways that, I don't know. Like, on one hand, I don't need it to because I'm not that into these comics. On the other hand, this Beast Saga specifically, like, this should be more thoroughly integrated, I think. Um, now, they're, the biggest thing that happens here, so no surprise that Beast is like just pure evil <laughs> and has gone rogue. Um, I'm seeing here from Xavier beast is Amanda Waller. There's definitely some of that. There's definitely some of that. That's not an, that's not a, you know, an off comp. Um, but I do think beast is like significantly viler, honestly. I mean the prag, like you're spot on with the pragmatism, right? And the, the I'll do anything for the greater good morality or amorality of Amanda Waller, but like Beast is, he's just kind of grosser. <laughs> but yeah, like, like let's do Beast versus everyone, as Kenji says here. I am very, very ready for that. Um, let's see, I'm Hit says, so contrived, is Krakoa this easily manipulated and all the clones are so tired and an overused trope? Yeah, I mean, definitely Percy has hit the cloning of everyone very hard. You know, because we have the very end of this issue teasing Beast. Not only is he cloning himself ad nauseum for infinite Beast hands, but he's also, he's like, he's creating his own Weapon X now, where he is creating Wolverine clones that he can weaponize and use as his own. Um, that, you know, that action coming from inside the house, if you will, right, with Beast doing it to Wolverine, I mean, that should have some serious sting, but Beast has been so beaten down and untrustworthy for so long that it's just like, it's just par for the course. Um, I saw somebody, I don't know if it was in here or on Twitter or what. I saw somebody say like it was still too soon for Beast. Like I still wasn't ready for Beast to be doing this. Like you have not been reading these comics <laughs> if you were not ready. Like this build has been literally four plus years in the making. And that's just the Krakoa era. It's actually been going on for longer. But like if you were not ready, like you either are just, you have a really hard time adjusting to change. <laughs> which is fair, or you've not been reading these comics. It has been this, that is the one thing you cannot criticize Percy for with X-Force and Wolverine. The idea that this has been like, uh, this is out of nowhere. <laughs> this could not, this could not be more out of somewhere. Completely, completely built up and, and sustained and justified. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. It was, it was a solid issue. Like I, a Wolverine versus Beast War. It just, it's one of those things too, where it's like, these are big enough players in the X-Men universe that like you kind of have to get everyone else involved. This can't just be an X-Force story. And I think that's one of the corners that that Percy has painted himself into um, that doesn't make sense anymore. Like it made sense in X-Force in like the Rick Remender run, for example, which I really love, that Wolverine would be like, we have to keep this stuff secret. The other mutants don't want to know about us killing all sorts of people, right? So like when he, he's like, all right, we're going to keep it to Psylocke and Angel and, and Deadpool um, and, you know, Age of Apocalypse, Nightcrawler. Like that made sense. There was, there was an in-story reason that I could just take and be like, yeah, sure, that makes sense. Um, with X-Force on Krakoa, it does not make sense anymore. It really doesn't. Like, like what? Is Wolverine not going to tell Professor X? <laughs> right? Like, why would the Quiet Council not be involved extensively on this? You know? Like, Deadpool and Omega, Omega Red should not be even getting at bats in this challenge to Krakow and Supremacy. Right? Like, this should be an all-hands-on-deck situation. Um, so that side of thing, I feel like, is going to be the, the suspension of disbelief that I frankly cannot achieve if Percy figures out a way. Incredible. I think that'd be really hard to do. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, you just kind of know it won't really connect because nothing in this in this universe has connected. I think the most interesting thing that happened here was in a data page, and it was about they were trying to find Beast backups, and all the backups were gone, and uh, except Beast left behind the backups from his Avengers days. It points out. It's subtle, mildly, and it's not the point of this issue, but that is telling us how they're going to bring Beast back. That right there tells us exactly how we are going to resolve the Dark Beast saga. It is going to be at the end of this, they will finally defeat Rogue Beast, or he'll go work with Orcus or something, and they will bring back Avengers-era bubbly bouncing beast. And we will get a fun beast back again. That's exactly what is going to happen. Um, there's no doubt about it in my mind. Is that a good thing? I mean, it, it excludes a lot of X-Men continuity. <laughs> like a hell of a lot. Like Beast has not been an Avenger since what? Like the early 80s? If even... I mean, it, it might just be the late seventies with like Jim Shooter and George Perez, um, or no? I guess I guess it is into the. Well, it might just be like eighty and eighty one because you get Beast kind of returns to the X Men, the refray, during the um, when Magneto traps all the X Men. I think this is Claremont and Burn. I don't think it's still Cockrum. I think it's Burn when Magneto traps them all in the Arctic, and he he has them all locked up and Nanny's being weird. <laughs> I think that's when Beast returns. Like trapped in the Arctic with Gene for a while. Um, anyway, the point being, you know, that's what, 40 plus years of X-Men stories that have been told since that time? You know, that's a big run back. But it is going to bring back the a version of Beast that everyone is clamoring for at this point, which is, of course, a joking, fun Beast. Uh, ironically, it's a lot like one of Beast's additional greatest sins, which was bringing back the O5, the original five X-Men, post-Avengers vs. X-Men, for them to, in the Bendis era, right? To be like, well, if, if the, you saw what you were like as teens, Scott, you would no longer want equality <laughs> for being kind, or whatever it was they were accusing Cyclops of incorrectly. Um, it's the same thing. I mean, it's the same thing. You know, it's just like, all right, so we're going to basically time travel here back to a specific version of a character that we think fans like. I don't know. It's, it's Like I said, like I've been saying this, like people are like, oh, there's no way to bring him back. It's character assassination. There's no beast is ruined forever. It's like, no, they're going to they're absolutely going to walk this back. It's just a matter of picking whatever Marvel Comics BS <laughs> you want to pick. Spin the wheel, you know, time travel, multiverse. Only backup available is the Avengers backup. Here we are. It's going to happen, uh, but <laughs> the question is, again, like, will this story ever end, and when will it happen? You know, which, if Fall of X can actually be it's more of a conclusive thing like we talked about earlier, then maybe that's when it happens. Maybe right after that. That'd be fine. I'd accept it. Um... <laughs> James points out Beast will then also forget how to cure the legacy virus. Yeah, there, there are going to be some problems, you know, when you when you run back on that much X-Men continuity. Like, there are going to be some issues. <laughs> there are things that might be worth remembering. Whatever, they'll they'll just, like, Cerebro and print him with that stuff. They'll, they'll figure it out um, in some kind of, again, very comic-y way. So, all right, so that's Wolverine number 31. I have nothing else to say about it than that. Uh, I, yeah, I don't know. Like, it's... This is the thing that this arc and that X-Force have been building to. So good. Like, let's let's keep that ball rolling. Don't lose the plot. Um, don't get sidetracked by the weird Russia stuff. No more Gene Janeer nonsense. Um, forget, li literally just forget all the Dracula vampire stuff. I don't care. Let it go. <laughs> just let it go and hone in on Beast at versus Wolverine. That's fine. That's fine at this point. Let's just enjoy that. Uh, the other issue that came out today that I read was Bishop War College number two. I have a complaint, but I feel like I've been complaining. 
So instead, I'm going to say, I appreciate how much Jay Holtham is integrating Orcus into this work. Uh, I really, and, and Victor Laval does this too in Sabretooth. I really like it when these writers coming in who have not been as involved in the Krakoa era come in with their minis and like more thoroughly integrate these newer elements a la the Orcus machine. Um, it's nice to see that. Good connectivity. It makes sense in the story. Uh, basically here, Orcus has sent Fenris to, I don't know, are they are they actually trying to capture? No, they're, just try, they're basically trying to test out this Blightswell something or other and its power on dampening mutant abilities. Um, and they just happen to run into Bishop running his War College, which better names for a college, I would argue, than War College. Um, Bishop, meanwhile, as you remember from the end of the first issue, has with Tempo been transported, they don't really know or understand how yet, um, through the, the effects of this Blightswell to a alternate reality, multiverse, we don't totally know what, uh, where all of the X-Men are black. And we see scant little of that in this issue. Uh, that remains, I mean, probably the reason to read this book, uh, but there's really not much happening in this issue aside from like literally seeing the alternate Lucas Bishop, who's a teacher at this uh, X-Men Academy. We see, you know, Black Professor X. Um, and we see what the, the original five X-Men look like, I guess, uh, in this multiverse. But yeah, like, I mean, if you, yeah, if you didn't read this issue, like, you know, wait, wait till a few come out. <laughs> the second issue didn't deliver a heck of a lot. Uh, the one thing it did do that really bummed me out, which is not really the fault of, of Holtham or anyone involved in Bishop War College, but uh, it, it used to mean something when Moira showed up in an issue. It used to mean something, man. Krakoa used to be a proper country. <laughs> Moira shows up in this issue for like three panels, and it just bummed me the hell out. She's just like she's just like a cog in the orcas machine shouting orders at Fenris. Like, ah, oh, like it used to mean something, man. Now it's nothing. Now it's nothing. Listen, I was thinking about this. If you had to pick, okay, we can have one thing continue. We can either have Moira still be the coolest character in X-Men with the most interesting story potential, or we can have the sustained island nation of Krakoa. You can only have one. Personally, I'm picking Moira every time. I would rather have that character with the mutant ability to reset reality in play and interesting and scheming than I would the entire island nation of Krakoa. I truly believe that. For me, that um, sets up more interesting future story that I was hooked on in House and Powers than the actual island. <laughs> and and mutant quote unquote utopia. Dirty secret. Kirko is not that interesting. You know? Maybe the potential's still there. But not that much time is actually spent on the island. You know? We don't actually see a lot of like what is happening there as a society. Some of the things that we have seen are incredibly flippin' weird. <laughs> you know? For example, like Cohen's just, you know, making babies and then disposing of them. Like, like that's a, a thing that any, like any person with any kind of attachment to, to humans would do. Um, I would so much rather have Moira than I would Kirkoa. Uh, it doesn't have to be, like, the, you know, the reality is like, well, why not both? Could have easily been both. Um, but I was just thinking about that. And it's like, ah, like of the things we, I, I remember listening to, this is when I was young. I remember I was listening to a music podcast I liked, and they were reviewing the Red Hot Chili Peppers Stadium Arcadium, <laughs> classic 2010 album, and or no, 2006. And uh, they were like, of all the 90s bands that we could have had, you know, Pearl Jam, still doing their thing, going hard, uh, Nirvana, of course, um, Jeff Buckley, I don't know if that's one they said, but it makes sense, just solo act. But they were like, you know, we got stuck with these boneheads. <laughs> we got stuck with the Red Hot Chili Peppers. And I'm a, I'm a Chili Peppers fan, actually. But that line has always resonated with me. I always thought that was funny. And that's kind of how the Moira situation feels. It's like, of all the potential we had, of all the story that was on the table, you know, what did we get? We got stuck with these boneheads. I don't know. 
there's still good stuff out there. But it's just like, man, when she shows up, it's just like, oh, what? Why do we throw that away? I, w- I would rather just Moira taken off the board entirely again. Frankly. It saves me the pain. <laughs> and these repetitive monologues. Okay, getting your questions, getting your thoughts. I'm going to take another sip of water. Let's hear what you got. Uh, Xavier asks here, don't all these things just signal another reboot? I don't think so. No. I mean, again, I think if Fall of X actually does its job and acts as a real status quo shift, I don't think we're looking at a reboot the magnitude of like House and Powers so much as a new direction for mutant kind and like essentially where Krakoa is positioned. You know, I mean, the, the word reboot, like, first off, like, the whole Marvel Universe isn't super likely to reboot around the X-Men. It's possible, but I don't see that happening. Um, and then, like, just the X-Men quote-unquote reboot. Like, like House and Powers is obviously, like, kind of the perfect example of, like, a soft reboot, right? Um, I think even calling it a reboot is kind of controversial. Uh, but no, I mean, I don't think it's going to be, like, a real, like you know, oh, Fall of X happens, and then, like, there's a totally new vision or direction or something. I'd be pretty surprised by that. Um, let's see. Will a writer ever dare to take up the mantle of the fabled Moira's 11th life? Uh, I can't, I just can't. It hurts too much. <laughs> I just can't do it. <laughs> let's see. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. I think that does it today. It's going to be a short one. That's fine. That's fine. I don't know that I have anything else really to dive into. Let's take a look as I'm talking here. What are next week's X-Men comics going to be? And what am I going to do with myself? Are they good enough to justify a CBH Live? I mean, this, this week was on the fence. I think, if we're being honest. Um, let's see, we got Marau- Marauders is still going. Okay, Marauders number 12. Storm and the Brotherhood of Mutants number 2. I'm super curious to see what that looks like. Uh, ooh, I think that's it, though. Okay, so we got Storm and the Brotherhood next week. Hmm. That's going to be a one-issue kind of stream. <laughs> let's see what else happens. Uh, maybe there'll be something interesting in this 60th X-Men anniversary. Otherwise... <coughs> excuse me, important things to talk about. Um, everybody check out Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur on Disney+. Plus. It rules, and it's awesome, and especially if you have kids, watch that show. It is my favorite Marvel animated series since Avengers Earth Mighty's Heroes, uh, probably in 2010, or if not before that, Spectacular Spider-Man, which was, I'm going to say 2007, 2008 era. Uh, it's, it's, it's on their level. It's on their level. It's not quite as, like, animated stuff for old nerds as those are uh it's definitely more intentionally directed towards youth (laughs) the youths but uh but it's quite good quite flipping good so that's a recommendation what other recs do we have today i finished the nice house on the lake finally yesterday and uh if you want to read my every every week i read you know a bunch of comics and i write about the most interesting ones in reading recommendations check out the comic book herald newsletter if you want to be getting those. I end every newsletter, which I've been running weekly all year, um, I end every newsletter with reading recommendations. This week I'm talking about The Nice House on the Lake, how I actually finished it. I've got it coming in at number 200 on the best comics of all time list. Uh, that's that's pretty esteemed company. It's quite high. Um, I rank my, I publish my top 500, but I'm now up to uh, almost 900 ranked, you know, full stories. And I do pretty big chunks. You know, I don't, I don't do like individual issues or anything. Uh, but the nice house on the lake, I had a number 200 and that felt kind of high. I was like, yeah, it's a new series. Maybe, you know, recency bias. I actually think the ending is kind of like, ah, okay. Like it, it didn't totally wow me, even though I think the first, I, you know, I've had it on my best of list the last two years. It's a really good series, but, um, uh, number 200 seemed high, but then every time I tried to move it lower, it was like, I can't do it. I can't do it. Tynion and uh, Alvaro Martinez Bueno, uh, amazing work. 
I mean, amazing work. It's a really good series. Highly recommend check it out. I, I was not, I won't spoil it, but like I was not like over the moon about the ending. I was not blown away. It's a little too, uh, I don't want to spoil it. I don't want to spoil it. So I'm not going to say anything. But check out the series. It's a good one. Uh, the other thing that I read that made it very high in the best comics of all time list uh, is Berlin by Jason Lutz. Now this series wrapped in 2018, I want to say. Um, it is not new. <laughs> it came out like over the course of a decade from like 2008 to 2018. It is, Jason Lutz does, um, it's hard to describe even, but it's like late 1920s into early 1930s, Berlin, Germany. So in between World War I and the build to the rise of Nazism and World War II. And it is incredible. It is one of the most well-constructed graphic novels I've ever read in my life. I ranked it number 18 of all time on the best comics of all time list. I think I have it right behind my favorite thing is Monsters and Scott Pilgrim, <laughs> which is a substantially less serious book. But holy cow, is that book relevant and good and well worth your time. If you haven't read Berlin, and I'd been putting it off, people talked about it, it's like, ah, okay, I don't know. It's it's super, super worth it. Um, so check that one out. That one That's the highest ranked book I've had since probably Pluto, the manga, which I put in at number 12. Uh, Open Mike Eagle asks, how do you sign up for the newsletter? That's a really good question. Um, I think probably what I would recommend is go to comicbookherald.com and... If you go to the About Me section in Navigation, there's a link to the CBH email newsletter, or I suppose what I could do, I could even post that here. Copy link address. Let's just do it. Uh, yeah, if you go there, you can sign up. Uh, yeah, basically, I just I, every week I post what we're reading in the My Marvelous Year reading club. I write about whatever is most interesting to me that week. So this week I wrote about why I'm loving Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur. The previous week I talked a little bit about Quantum Mania. Um, I think a week before that I talked about Brian Hitch saying there's no good comic websites, kind of whatever captures my attention. And then I end it with reading recommendations of a, almost always non-superhero stuff that I'm reading on the side. Uh, okay, do we have any final questions? Otherwise we can wrap this puppy. Let's see. Banksy points out there was a new excellent number one today. <laughs> I did see that. Uh, I, I think with the excellent, all I want to do is I just want to say uh, Peter Milligan and Mike Allred's Ecstatics, X-Force into Ecstatics from the early 2000s is so incredible and so good and one of my favorite Marvel series of all time. And regardless of my disinterest <laughs> in reviving that project, you if you have not read those books, oh my gosh, go read the original X-Force and Ecstatics. So incredible. So, so, so good. Let's see. JD says, did you catch Wolverine fighting a Last of Us fungus beast? <laughs> I definitely did. It was definitely the first thing that came to mind. Love the Last of Us game. Still have not watched a single moment of the TV series, although obviously it is hugely popular and, uh, and has gotten a ton of attention. Um, it kind of just makes me want to replay the games, actually, instead of even watching it. I don't know, just a time limitation thing. I if, if everybody here is like, oh my gosh, no, it's not the same thing. You have to watch. I'll consider it. I will seriously consider it. But uh, in the meantime, I mean, maybe I'll just do a Last of Us replay. I'm still, I'm actually just wrapping Midnight Suns. <laughs> Has been like eating so much of my time. I played the hell out of that game. Uh, Midnight Suns. It is very, a very nice, addicting, um, kind of just like, blow off steam and don't think about anything kind of game at this point. Characterization is really good in that as far as Marvel characters too. Like I think I've talked about this before, but like there are characters I like more having played Midnight Suns, like Nico, Minora, um, Magic, uh, even Scarlet Witch, honestly, in some ways. It's a cool, cool game with flaws for sure. Um, let's see. Vass says must watch. Randall says Last of Us is mid- <laughs> it's definitely not the uh, not the vibe I've gotten, but I appreciate that take. Um, JD says, great show, never seen the game. Yeah, I mean, if I hadn't played the game, I would definitely be in on it, for sure. Uh, I'm hesitant, I think, you know, just because of, like, I don't, I don't enjoy seeing things that I've already enjoyed replicated, you know, which is definitely part of my, my difficulty with comic book movies and TV. But uh, I'm curious. I'm curious uh, how good The Last of Us could possibly be. I don't know. I got so much stuff to catch up on. 
So much stuff to catch up on. Although we did, uh, my wife and I started, um, ah, shoot, what's the Peacock one? With uh, Poker Face. That's that's a good little comfort food show. That one's been, that's a nice comfort food. Throw it on and just feel, uh, feel those justified kind of almost uh, procedural vibes. Been enjoying that. All right. Getting your thoughts on The Last of Us. I'm going to wrap it. Thanks, everybody. For joining, really appreciate you being here. Again, I'm Dave and kind of almost have at comicarol.com. It's time for the email newsletter here in the in the comments. And I will, I guess, be back. Listen, I'll be back next week if Ali Ewing brings the heat. If Storm and the Brotherhood of Mutants is that good, I will be back next week. Otherwise, we're gonna have to jump it probably two weeks and then we'll do uh, a catch up. We'll do the issues that week and the 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 issues the week before i'm just seeing the following week there's a book called x-men unforgiven and this is the first i've heard of this it's a vampire book written by team tim seeley okay <laughs> we'll talk about that in two weeks thanks everybody for joining and as always enjoy the comments comments comics